So when we left off in chapter 12 of Hoot, we had um, Roy giving his name for mullet fingers so that he could be treated at the hospital and mom and dad showing up. <clears throat> Not good. Officer Delinko had insisted on giving the Eberhards a ride to the hospital. It was the decent thing to do and also a prime opportunity to score points with Roy's father. The patrolman hoped that Mr. Eberhardt's son wasn't involved in the continuing mischief at the Pancake House construction site. What a sticky situation that would be. On the drive to the hospital, Roy's parents sat in the back seat and spoke quietly between themselves. His mother said she couldn't imagine how Roy had gotten bitten by a dog while working on a science project. Maybe it had something to do with hamburger meat, she speculated. Hamburger, said Roy's father. What kind of school project uses hamburger? <clears throat> in the rearview mirror, Officer Delinko could see Mr. Everhart put an arm around his wife's shoulders. Her eyes were moist and she was biting her lower lip. Mr. Everhart appeared as tightly wound as a clock spring. When they got to the emergency room, the desk clerk declared that Roy was sleeping and couldn't be disturbed. The Everharts tried to reason to, with him, but the clerk wouldn't budge. We're his parents, Mr. Everhart said evenly, and we intend to see him right away. Sir, don't make me call a supervisor. I don't care if you call the Wizard of Oz, Mr. Everhart said. We're going in. The clerk trailed through the swinging double doors. You can't do this, he objected, scooting ahead of the Everharts and blocking the hallway to the patient ward. Officer Delinko edged forward, assuming that the sight of a police officer would soften the fellow's attitude. He was mistaken. Absolutely no visitors, it says right here on the doctor's note. The clerk solemnly waved a clipboard. I'm afraid you'll have to go back to the waiting room, and this means you too, officer. Officer Delinko shrank away, but not the Eberhards. Listen, that is our son lying there, Roy's mother reminded the clerk. You called us, remember? You told us to come. Yes, and you may see Roy as soon as the doctor says it's allowed. Then page the doctor now, Mr. Eberhardt's voice re remained level, but the volume had gotten much louder. Pick up the phone and dial. If you've forgotten how, we'll be happy to show you. The doctor's on a break. She'll be back in 25 minutes, the clerk said tersely. Then she can find us right here, Mr. Eberhardt said, visiting our injured son. Now, if you don't move out of the way, I'm going to drop kick you all the way to Ch Chokolowski. Do you understand me? The clerk went pale. I'm reporting you to my supervisor. That's a dandy idea. Mr. Eberhardt brushed past her and started down the hall, guiding his wife by the elbow. Hold it right there, snapped a firm female voice behind them. The Eberhardt stopped and turned. Emerging from a door marked staff only was a woman wearing a baby blue scrub and a stethoscope. I'm Dr. Gonzalez. Where do you think you're going? To see our son, replied Mrs. Eberhardt. I tried to stop them, the desk clerk piped up. You're Roy's parents, the doctor asked the Eberhards. We are. Roy's father noticed Dr. Gonzalez eyeing them with an odd curiosity. Pardon me if this is out of line, she said, but you sure don't look like you work on a crab boat. What on earth are you talking about, Roy's mother said. Is everybody at the hospital a total wacko? There must be some mistake, Officer Delinko interjected. Mr. Everhart is a federal law enforcement officer. Dr. Gonzalez sighed. Well, we'll sort this out later. Come on, let's go peek in on your boy. The emergency patient ward had six beds, five of which were unoccupied. The sixth bed had a white privacy curtain drawn around it. We've got him on IV antibiotics and he's doing pretty well, Dr. Gonzalez said in a low voice. But unless we find those dogs, he's going to need a series of rabies injections. Those are no fun. The Eberhards locked arms as they approached the enclosed bed. Officer Delinko stood behind them, wondering what color shirt Roy would be wearing. In the patrolman's pocket was the bright green scrap of clothing that he had snagged from Mother Paula's fence. Don't be surprised if he's sleeping, the doctor whispered, gently pulling the curtain away. Nobody said a word for several moments. The four grown-ups just stood there, staring blank-faced at an empty bed. From a metal rig on a plastic bag of ginger-colored fluid, the intravenous tube di disconnected and dangling to the floor. Finally, Mrs. Eberhardt gasped, Where's Roy? Dr. Gonzalez's arms flapped helplessly. I just, I really, I don't know. You don't know? Mr. Eberhardt erupted. One minute an injured boy is asleep on this bed, and the next minute he's vanished? Officer Delinko stepped between Mr. Eberhardt and the doctor. The patrolman was afraid that Roy's father was upset enough to do something he might later regret. Where is our son? Mrs. Eberhardt demanded again. The doctor buzzed for a nurse and frantically started searching the emergency ward. But he was the only patient here, Mr. Eberhardt said. How can you possibly lose the one and only patient you've got? What happened? Did aliens beam him up to their spaceship while you were on a coffee break? Roy! Roy, where are you? cried Mrs. Everhart. She and Dr. Gonzalez began checking beneath the other five beds in the ward. Officer Delinko whipped out his portable radio and said, I'm calling for backup. Just then, the double doors to the waiting room flew open. Mom, Dad, I'm right here. 
The Eberhards practically smothered their son with a tandem hug. Little devil, chuckled Officer Delinko, hoistering his radio. He was pleased to see that Roy was not wearing a torn green t-shirt. Whoa, Dr. Gonzalez clapped her hand sharply. Everyone hold on a minute. The Eberhards looked up quizzically. The doctor didn't even seem especially enjoyed, overjoyed to have found her lost patient. That's Roy, she said, pointing to their son. Of course it is. Who else would it be? Mrs. Everhart kissed the top of his head. Honey, you get back in that hospital bed right now. Not so fast, Mr. Everhart said. I'm not sure what's going on here, but I have a feeling we owe the doctor an apology. Probably several apologies. He planted both hands on Roy's shoulders. Let's see those dog bites, partner. Roy lowered his eyes. I didn't get bit, Dad. It wasn't me. Mrs. Everhart groaned. Okay, now I get it. I'm the crazy one, right? I'm the traveling loony bird? Folks, folks, excuse me, but we still have a major problem, Dr. Gonzalez said. We still have a patient missing. Officer Delinko was thoroughly confused. Once again, he reached for his radio in anticipation of calling headquarters. Before my brain explodes, said Mrs. Everhart, would somebody please explain what all this is about? Only one person can do that, Mr. Everhart, gestured to towards Roy, who suddenly wanted to crawl down a hole and hide. His father turned him around to face Dr. Gonzalez. Tex, she said, arching her eyebrows. Roy felt his face redden. I'm really sorry. This is a hospital. This is no place for games. I know it's not. I apologize. If you are the real Roy, the doctor said, then who is that young man in the bed and where did he go? I want the truth. Roy stared at the top of his sneakers. He couldn't remember another day in his life when so many things had gone wrong. Son, his father said, answer the doctor. His mother squeezed his arm. Come on, honey, it's important. You can be sure we're going to find him, Officer Delinko chimed in, sooner or later. Bleakly, Roy looked up to address the grown-ups. I don't know the boy's name, and I don't know where he is, and I'm sorry, but that's the absolute truth. And technically, it was. Chapter 13. While Roy took a shower, his mother made a pot of spaghetti. He ate three helpings, through, though the dinner gathering was as quiet as a chess match. Setting down his fork, Roy turned to his father. I guess it's the den, huh? That's correct. It had been years since Roy had gotten a spanking, and he doubted he was in for one now. The den was for where his father summoned him whenever there was serious explaining to do. Tonight, Roy was so tired that he wasn't sure he had anything to say that would make sense. His father was waiting, seating behind the broad walnut desk. What have you got there, he asked Roy. A book. Yes, I can see it's a book. I was hoping for the particulars. Roy's father could be sarcastic when he thought he wasn't getting a full answer, and Roy figured it came from years of interrogating shifty characters, gangsters or spies, or whatever it was that his father was in the business of investigating. I'm assuming, he said to Roy, that the book will cast some light on tonight's strange events. Roy handed it across the desk. You and Mom got it for me two Christmases ago. I remember, his father said, scanning the cover, the Sibley Guide to Birds. Are you sure it wasn't your birthday? I'm sure, Dad. Roy had put the book on his Christmas list after it had settled a friendly wager between him and his father. One afternoon, they had seen a large, reddish-brown raptor swoop down and snatch a ground squirrel off a cattle range in the Gallatin River Valley. Roy's father had let him had bet him a milkshake that the bird was a young bald eagle whose crown feathers hadn't turned white, but Roy had said it was a fully grown golden eagle more common to the dry prairies. Later, after visiting the Bozeman Library and consulting Sibley, Roy's father conceded that Roy had been right. Mrs. Mr. Ebert held up the book and asked, what does this have to do with that nonsense at the hospital? And we're going to stop there.